a war in colonies, a 1914-1918 conference. Uh, and we are continuing with uh, the same theme that we left off uh, before lunch, which is the impact of the Great War on the colonies. And uh, uh, before I start, maybe some few young people could come up front. Uh, it's a great place to sleep at the back and after lunch. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I must at the very outset, uh, uh, I can't resist chipping in with a few words and say how delighted I am to be here. Um, back uh, in India, uh, I'm part of uh, uh, a, a steering group which is actually um, uh, working on uh, uh, the uh, centenary commemoration of the First World War, uh, both nationally as well as internationally. So when I got this invitation from uh, Monsieur Olivier Litvin, I, I was absolutely delighted. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we are actually going to be organizing an international conference on India and the Great War from the 5th to the 7th of March, and I thought we would be first off the bat, but uh, um, the Alliance Francaise de Dhaka has obviously stolen a march on us, and, uh, you know, so you, you are first, uh, first on, on the post. But um, it, it's, it's a really, really interesting subject, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for putting this together because it is in many ways a forgotten narrative as far as the countries of South Asia are concerned, that's for sure. And uh, increasingly, talking to some of the speakers, uh, it becomes even more clearer that uh, this is a forgotten history, not just in, uh, uh, in this part of the world, but also in many other of the erstwhile colonies, as well as uh, the erstwhile uh, colonizers. Uh, this session, again, promises to be an extremely interesting one. We have uh, um, a panel of four speakers. Uh, we have uh, Philip Orr from Ireland, um, Dr. Samuel Berthet, who, who's uh, in the Shivnada University, uh, Dr. Sayeda Razana Rashid, and uh, Professor Dr. Iftikhar Iqbal, who will be batting for the home team. and. Uh, uh, they will be covering uh, a fairly diverse but extremely interesting uh, range of subjects. Uh, the uh, first speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Philip Orr, and uh, Philip is a Belfast-based uh, writer and community worker who has studied the Irish experience of the First World War. And uh, in the 1980s, he interviewed many of the surviving veterans um, uh, the Irish veterans of, of that war. Um, Ireland, as all of you know, has had a, 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 a complicated history, as a lot of nations do, but I think they've had more than their share of complications. And uh, as a result of uh, his interaction and his uh, subsequent interest that has developed in the subject, uh, he's, he has written uh, two books. One is uh, um, the Road to the Somme and the Field of Bones. And these books focus on the experiences of ordinary soldiers uh, on the Western Front and at Gallipoli. Uh, they also explore the mythological uses of that war in post-imperial Ireland. Uh, I was talking to uh, Philip before uh, the session began earlier this morning, and I was struck by some of the commonalities of the Irish um, colonial experience vis-a-vis -vis Britain and uh, what we experience uh, on the subcontinent. Uh, in many ways, as all of you are aware, um, Bangladesh or, or, or the partition of the subcontinent uh, is a direct result of uh, processes that were uh, perfected by uh, Imperial Britain uh, in Ireland, and then applied uh, in uh, then undivided India, which was the policy of divide and rule. And uh, Philip Stock attempts to explain why the Great War continues to have uh, such deep uh, significance as an identity narrative in uh, uh, modern Ireland. Uh, and as he rightly says, it's uh, an island which was, after all, 
a, lab a laboratory for empire during the dawn of British imperialism. So without taking too much time, I'd like to hand you over to Mr. Philip Orr. Thank you very much, Rana, and it's a pleasure to be here from Ireland and to talk to you all today. And I hope that you'll find that what I have to say about Irish history uh, stirs some thoughts in your own mind about your own history and maybe uh, see some links and connections across uh, hundreds of miles across the world during that period of conflict and bloodshed that we know as the Great War. But it might seem inappropriate to include Ireland in a conference about that war and the colonies. In 1914, Ireland was an integral part of Britain. And if you know the Union Jack, the diagonal red cross that is in that Union Jack is the flag of Ireland, the flag of our patron saint, St. Patrick. Indeed, Ireland was just a few miles across the sea from Britain and visible on any good day. It had been ruled directly for over a century from Westminster, and in the British House of Commons there were over a hundred Irish MPs. And when the Irish went, British went to war in 1914, there were officers with Irish backgrounds in its military elite, just as there had been in the past. But Irish regiments filled with ordinary Irish infantrymen, often from poor and humble backgrounds, had also played a role as enforcers of empire. The Dublin Fusiliers had begun their career in 19th century India. Another Irish regiment, the Munster Fusiliers, were based in Burma when war broke out in 1914 and travelled back to Europe to fight the German enemy via Calcutta and Bombay. After the war was over, Irish regiments would help police the newly mandated territories like Palestine and Mesopotamia that had been carved from the corpse of the Ottoman Empire. And on the eve of the Great War, there were merchants who had benefited from far-off colonial trade, Irish missionaries who'd helped bring Christianity across the world, Irish administrators who'd found roles in Britain's worldwide civil service, and Irish emigrants who had found homes and colonial status abroad. A number of leaders in pre-1914 Irish nationalism expressed their warm respect for the British Empire. John Redmond, the most powerful Irish man in the House of Commons in London, had proclaimed that he'd like to see a new, more autonomous Ireland, but to remain as a friend of Britain and the brightest jewel, as he called it, in her crown of empire. Yet despite being complicit in empire, I would contend that Ireland appears in this conference today for a very different reason. Ireland was England's first colony, I would claim, involving a project of penetration and conquest that began in the Middle Ages and was thought, quite wrongly, to have been completed by the end of the 17th century. Ireland was, I contend, a laboratory for the British imperial project that reached its geopolitical high watermark in the first half of the 20th century. In previous epochs of rivalry between Britain and her European neighbours, Spain and France, Ireland was the unguarded space to the west, an island of dark woodlands, fog and bog, possessing a strange Gaelic culture, a Celtic tongue, an unreformed Catholic faith. And after a successful but bloody Irish war by Queen Elizabeth, a huge experiment in population transfer occurred in which thousands of Protestant settlers were encouraged to sail west across the Irish Sea and settle the rebellious northern province of Ulster, subdue it, civilize it, develop it. The process is known as the plantation of Ulster, and my own paternal ancestors were part of that experiment. Amongst the features of conquest and control exhibited over the following three centuries were strategies that came to be applied in colonized spaces everywhere. Mapping of the territory, supersession of the indigenous language with the master tongue of the colonizer, proselytizing projects by missionaries, sequestration by wealthy landlords of the best land, and a classification of the native people as childlike, feckless, 
sometimes charming, but also prone to warlike temperament that would eventually be schooled into the art of soldiering for the empire. The Irish centuries would be marked by episodes of rebellion, often aided by Britain's powerful European enemies. And then when a massive famine, and we talked about famine earlier today, a massive famine swept across Ireland in the mid-19th century, leading to the death of over a million Irish people and several decades of mass emigration, armed revolt was left to regroup in the shadows and faith placed instead in a non-violent nationalism that focused on land reform, the recovery of political dignity, and local parliamentary representation. Meanwhile, English, Scots, and Welsh troops garrisoned Ireland in a range of barracks, whilst Irish men were encouraged to join that very same British army for engagement in overseas affairs. At one stage, over a third of Britain's Victorian army was Irish. But the World War would be a game changer. Armed revolt against British rule took place, a revolt that would lead to the unraveling of the empire in Britain's first colony, one that would furnish an example to a watching world of how decolonization could happen. I'd like to focus on Ireland's wartime experiences, but also on their legacy, not only for the Irish national project, but more discomfortably for the descendants of those Ulster planters who'd been drafted into Ireland to stem rebellion three centuries before, for whom an undiluted Britishness was and still is an article of faith, and for whom voluntary participation in the Great War was and still is a source of pride and a marker of embattled identity. In 1914, Irish servicemen then, thousands of whom were already in the British forces, were encouraged, asked to join up to the colours. But in the brisk search for his new volunteer mass army in Britain, Lord Kitchener, the war minister, set up three new infantry divisions to entice Irish soldiers in. But Ireland at the outbreak of hostilities was itself in turmoil. The peaceful campaign of John Redmond, I've already mentioned him, had persuaded the British Liberals in government to grant Ireland a home rule parliament in Dublin, inside the empire. A modest measure, but one resolutely opposed by the descendants of those planter people whom I've just spoken about. Describing themselves as unionists and loyalists, members of this Protestant and often prosperous community dominated life in the north of the island. By 1914, Ireland was bristling with smuggled weapons as two rival militias faced one another, prepared to fight either against home rule or else for it. And it was a dispute that threatened to split the political elite in Britain itself. The Conservative Party felt strongly that liberal plans for Irish self-government, guess what, could lead to the breakup not just of Great Britain, but of the empire. And much of the top brass in the military agreed. Given Ireland's history of soldiering, as I've outlined for you, it's not surprising that thousands of volunteers made their way to the recruiting stations in the autumn of 1914, including relatives of mine. The Home Rule Act was put on ice until the war would be over. It was given the royal assent, but with the provision that serious amendments could be made to it. This strategic ambivalence would be enough to encourage Redmond, the nationalist leader, and Carson, the unionist leader, to call on their supporters to join the war effort, each with the ludicrously opposing hope that service for the empire would result in a political reward when the armistice finally came. In September 1914, the 36th Ulster Division was set up with a unionist ethos and the 16th Division, a military home for nationalists. Recruiting posters were designed to appeal to either side. Nationalists would go to fight for the cause of little Catholic Belgium, attacked by the Hun, and Unionists would fight for that great Protestant edifice, the British Empire. For the thousands of men from nationalist backgrounds who joined participation in the war, most of the time, I think, would have been not unlike that of many other soldiers engaged with the daily routine of soldiering in difficult and often highly dangerous conditions. 
But nationalists also faced certain challenges. Leadership of the 16th Division, for example, tended to remain in the hands of non-nationalists, reflecting old hierarchies. The British military were skeptical about the ability of the Irish often to offer reliable soldiering, reflecting stereotypes about the Irishman as impulsively brave, but lacking in self-discipline. It is clear that Irish soldiers were more likely to be court-martialed for supposed cowardice or desertion or refusing orders, and we know that they were more likely to be sentenced and shot. The situation worsened after the Irish Rebellion of Easter 1916, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and the subsequent rise of the militant political party known as Sinn Féin. Talk about them in a moment too. Some Irish troops were subject to insults cast at them by other soldiers who labelled them as Sinn Féiners, even though they were fighting for the British Empire on a daily basis. Indeed, it was this insurrection at Easter on the streets of Ireland's capital city that proved to be the key event of the war years for Ireland. The men and women who planned it were in the secret microgroup known as the Irish Republican Brotherhood, heir to a tradition of armed revolt with foreign aid. The main participants in the fighting were the minority from within John Redmond's supporters who had refused his call to the Western Front to fight. Also involved were Comunaban, a group of militant Republican women, and the Irish Citizens' Army, which was a small Marxist unit. The numbers taking part were small, 1,300 at the most, but for a week the insurgents held on to central Dublin before Britain drafted in fresh troops to crush the rebellion. The leaders were court-martialed and shot. Other participants rounded up and interned. And initial indifference on the part of the general public soon turned to sympathy and then support as the deaths and incarcerations occurred. There was a proclamation read out at the general post office in Dublin, which the rebels had occupied as headquarters. It was a stirring document. It called significantly on all Irish men and Irish women to rise up against what they called centuries of oppression and proclaimed the right of the people of Ireland, they said, to the ownership of Ireland. The signatories of the proclamation sought what they called the unfettered control of Irish destinies and welfare and exaltation amongst the nations. The document spoke scathingly of something we have maybe touched on a little bit today. The recent differences amongst Irish men had been carefully fostered by an alien government and it spoke favorably of Ireland's gallant allies in Europe. One rebel leader, Roger Casement, famous for his humanitarian work in the Congo, traveled to Europe hoping that Germans would prove to be a gallant ally. He obtained arms for Ireland, gained access to Irish prisoners of war, and tried to persuade them to fight for the Central Powers. The latter project met with little success. The former project ended falling apart when a shipment of guns was seized by the British on the high seas. He himself arrested, having been decanted from a U-boat on a lonely beach on the Irish coast. Casement was hanged and his body placed in quicklime in Pentonville Jail in London. But let me tell you about one other significant event that year. John Redmond's brother Willie, an MP who had volunteered for soldiering on the Western Front, was killed in action. And when a by-election was held in his constituency, the winner was a young man called Eamon de Valera, a rebel leader whose death sentence had been commuted. He stood for the party called Sinn Féin, an Irish term which can be translated into English either as ourselves alone or perhaps more meaningfully in the Indian context as self-sufficient. Sinn Féin, which offered support for the Rising, was on an electoral roll and it eventually triumphed in the general elections at the war's end in December 1918. Sinn Féin was helped by one other very interesting thing. Short of manpower, the British government had introduced conscription, compulsory conscription in 1916 on the mainland, if you want to call it that, in England, Scotland and Wales. Now that... Uh, 
New uh, men were needed in 1917 to face the German army. There were plans to introduce conscription in the, across the Irish Sea where recruitment had dried up. In a series of rallies with formidable publicity campaign, Sinn Féin stood out against Irish conscription, and in the end, it didn't take place. So, you can see, in the course of the First World War, they had become the dominant face of Irish nationalism, rising from nowhere to claim 75 seats in Westminster. But would they take their seats in London? No. They refused to attend the Imperial Parliament and set up their own assembly in Dublin, known by the old Irish word for an assembly, Doyle the Doyle. Over the next few years, the War of Irish Independence took place and an Irish Republican army undertook a guerrilla campaign against representatives of, Br of the British Crown. Military force was accompanied by other acts of resistance, including the creation of people's courts to replace British justice. And when Britain used the prison system to deal with Republican activity, the hunger strike became a formidable weapon and that has resonances in this part of the world also. By 1921, the British leadership, keen to focus on other political issues at home and abroad, agreed to a truce with the Irish Republican Army. And at the end of that year, a treaty was signed allowing for the creation of an Irish free state. Still theoretically within the empire and under the rule of the British king, but in reality, the Irish regime now possessed new flag, new Dublin parliament, new judicial system, police force, and many other features of sovereignty. However, the impact of a brutal world war was still felt during the War of Independence. Britain had employed hardened military veterans to supplement the hard-pressed police in Ireland during the War of Independence. The brutality of these servicemen, known as the Black and Tans, after their uniform, is still legendary in Ireland. 200,000 Irishmen had also fought for Britain in the recent war, and 30,000 or more had died. And veterans returned to an island that had, in the words of the poet W.B. Yeats, already quoted, changed utterly as a terrible beauty seemed to have been born. Some veterans lay low, struggled to understand the changes, while others actually joined the Irish Republican Army, known now as the IRA. So many stories from that era are revealing. How about this one? Field Marshal Henry Wilson was a British officer whose role in repressing the Irish independence struggle was well known. He was shot dead on the streets of London in 1922. And the man who killed him was readily apprehended. He was struggling to get away owing to a wooden leg. Testimony to injuries sustained as an Irish soldier with the British Army during the Great War. I could mention one other Irish ex-serviceman from Belfast, father of a friend of mine, who was eligible for two pensions back in the 1920s. One was a disability pension from the British earned in the trenches of the Western Front with the Army. The other was a pension from the Irish Free State Government for membership of the IRA, which he joined on his return from the trenches. He chose the British pension as it was larger and he had a huge family to feed. Of course, the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 had not finally sorted out the issue of British rule in Ireland, far from it. One of the key features of the treaty had been the exclusion of the northern six counties due to unionist pressure. During the War of Independence, sectarian violence had flared in the city of Belfast. And by 1920, the British government had conceded that the island would have to be partitioned. By 1922, a Northern Ireland state existed alongside the Irish Free State to the south the former entirely within the United Kingdom, but possessing its own parliament in Belfast, in which a unionist majority could exercise rule. The situation was not a stable one, and a nationalist minority in the north would rebel, and in the 1970s, a new episode of violence enveloped my part of the world. As the free state moved towards the status of republic, it departed from the empire in the 1940s, Evidence that Irishmen had fought for the empire remained here and there in the very infrastructure, in the very architecture of Ireland's capital city. There was talk of pulling down an arch, commemorating Irish troops who had taken part in the South African wars that had preceded the Great War, known to many as Traitor's Gate. 
it nonetheless remained intact and is still there to this day. What I'm pointing out, I think, is that in actuality, when new public statuary was created in the Free State, it understandably focused on Easter 1916 and the heroes of the War of Independence. But a considerable, if minimal, tacit memorialization of the First World War was still permitted to occur. Memorial services in Protestant churches continued, commemorative poppies were permitted to be worn, and occasionally public plaques and memorials created, even in public spaces. A beautiful memorial park on the outskirts of Dublin was designed by the famous architect known in this part of the world, Edwin Lutyens, and built by veterans from both the British Army and the Irish Republican Army in the 1920s and 30s. Fell into neglect by the 1950s. And then as a new violence emerged in the North in the 1970s, it was unlikely that a, an architectural a uh, showpiece like that would be revived, or indeed any talk, any great talk about involvement of your ancestors in the Irish Republic, in the British Army many years ago. Because the British Army was on the streets of Northern Ireland in a new episode of civil strife. However, in recent years, the uh, Republic of Ireland had gained post-colonial confidence, reached for prosperity in the last two decades, and gained a more cosmopolitan identity. And it has been possible to continue the work of salvaging this intriguing story of involvement in the war. Much of the best salvage has been done in the Republic by individuals and families and communities who wish to understand what took their ancestors to serve in a horrendous war. Was it poverty? Was it an urge for adventure? It's a mix of things, I think. We have to ask, did the Irish regiments provide a real possibility of Celtic pride in the way they were constructed, the music that the bands played, the names that were given to the regiments. However, I want to finally, draw, almost finally, draw attention to the role of the Great War in the unionist mindset that I referred to, the mindset of those in the Northern Ireland state who feel under pressure in recent decades that they want to remain part of Britain. After partition, the Northern Ireland state was glad of an opportunity for a founding narrative. And one particular story came to hand. The 36th Ulster Division that I mentioned, very unionist unit inside the British Army, had taken part in the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July 1916 with grievous losses, including 5,000 dead or wounded in a morning. By the 1920s, commemoration of those psalm deaths on the 1st of July had become a key part of the calendar in Northern Ireland, involving parades, religious services, the display of Union flags, and declarations of continued loyalty to the Empire. Plaques and statues appeared everywhere. Paintings of the charge of the Ulster Division at the Battle of the Somme were hung in local government buildings. In France, on the site of the battle, a memorial tower was erected, which would become a site of pilgrimage to Ulster Unionists. And in recent years, that mythology hasn't gone away. The mythology of the Somme has grown in intensity in a Northern Ireland convulsed by civil unrest. And now that demographic changes are whittling away the Unionist majority in Northern Ireland, it seems that this story of sacrifice for the empire, loyalty unto death, is seen as a powerful testament of who that people really feel they are. And in an extraordinary explosion of what you would call folk art, on the gable end, the wall ends of working class areas of Belfast, where many Protestants and Unionists live, you will see very many vivid and extraordinary images of the First World War appearing as emblems of identity. In 2016, thousands of people from that background will make their way to the Ulster Tower in France to commemorate their ancestral dead and proclaim their ongoing loyalty. The final thing I want to say is this. There is another competing narrative involving recognition that the First World War, first of all, saw service from soldiers from diverse political backgrounds on our island, but also was the cauldron in which the Easter Rebellion occurred and the possibility of Irish independence emerged. 
Recently, the British monarch, Queen Elizabeth, came to the Irish Republic, a first ever royal visit, the first ever official royal visit since partition in the 1920s. And she visited the memorial to the dead of the Easter Rising to lay a wreath alongside the Irish president. After which, both ladies visited the Island Bridge Memorial Park for all the dead Irish men of the Great War, and there they paid their respects. The symbolism was powerful. In one sense, the World War has been given an important status now in Ireland as a place of common understanding, perhaps, or discussion or debate about where we all come from in an often interlinked and conflicted past. In this regard, a friend and myself, both coming from different political backgrounds, are undertaking a project called the Poppy and the Lily, a project that we roll out in communities where there is still some strife. The poppy flower, of course, emblem of British sacrifice in the war, and the Lily, which is a symbol for northern nationalists of unfinished business from the Easter Rebellion in 1916. In this project, we hold workshops in which the legacy of several hundred years of raw identity politics can be talked about, prompted by a particular focus on the events of 1914 to 18 and how they shaped all of our lives in both islands, Britain and Ireland. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for the most uh, interesting and uh, uh, illuminating talk. wasn't aware of a lot of uh, the issues that were covered. And uh, I'd just like to say that, you know, it's interesting that while uh, uh, the Irish were uh, permitted a certain amount of uh, memorialization of the Great War, um, as far as uh, the Indian subcontinent is concerned, uh, the lack of uh, political identity in uh, uh, 1914 has denied uh, the soldiers of this uh, region uh, with uh, not just um, uh, an acknowledgement of their uh, sacrifice, but also um, uh, a commemoration of their of their role. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Samuel Berthe and he will be talking about of, uh, the impact of the First World War on law and national sovereignty. Um, again, a very interesting aspect, and uh, I, for one, um, in, am eagerly looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, he, uh, he talks about how uh, the, the First World War intensified the processes of globalization as we know them today, and this includes uh, uh, the field of international law. And he makes a reference to uh, the growing political movement in the Indian subcontinent and the increasing radi radicalization uh, that this uh, movement saw following the partition of Bengal and uh, how a certain segment of Indian nationalists relocated to French territory, and um, uh, subsequently, uh, the, uh, under pressure from the British authorities, uh, the French modified their legal uh, systems to permit, um, um, uh, to, or rather to outlaw uh, the, uh, the Indian nationalists that were uh, operating from, uh, from their soil. And, uh, uh, he, he goes on to make uh, 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 the link to the rhetoric of a war against terror uh, and uh, uh, how uh, this finds a resonance with uh, the events of uh, that time. Um, and I'm sure uh, we'll have a very interesting session. So over to Dr. Berthe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arana. Well, uh, my, my participation to this conference is not as a specialist of World War I, but as a specialist of history of colonization, and particularly the colonization of the subcontinent. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, uh, by quoting uh, uh, Molana Abdul Kalam Azad, the well-known uh, uh, statement of the subcontinent. Uh, in an interview to uh, a French uh, writer in the early 1920s, he, he gave this very interesting uh, comment, which I think uh, takes us right at the heart of our uh, subject. Um, I, trans I retranslated uh, 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 from French to English, though I'm sure those are not exactly uh, his words, but that will convey the, the sense. Um, in this interview, uh, Molan Abdul Kalam Azad says, said, Europe is very wrong in believing in the hostility and resentment of Asia and imagining that we are getting ready for some furious and vengeful assault. Our goal is very different. We aspire for liberty and peace. We dream about a world order where the East and the West, instead of being at loggerheads, would unite their forces and genius. However, who will accomplish this rapprochement and this union? The British have shown that they are incapable of doing it. Not long ago, we still counted on France, on its liberal spirit, on its generosity. The years that have passed since the Great War have seen the, the East great hopes crumble. So for Moulin Abdul Kalam Azad, the First World War is really a turning point in um, the idea of the uh, colonized country from what he calls the East or Asia or this very undefined region which is called the East uh, coming together with uh, their brothers from, from the West, uh, for a better word. Well, um, I'm using for the following paper some archive from the French Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, some unpublished material, and I'm also using a very uh, unlightful uh, work uh, on British intelligence uh, by Richard uh, James Popplewell, titled Intelligence and Imperial Defense, British Intelligence and the Defense of the Indian Empire, 904-1924. As a matter of fact, uh, it appears that World War I is a turning point regarding the history of uh, surveillance and intelligence, with the Indian community uh, at the center of this change in relation to, uh, to France, um, as we are going to see uh, uh, um, now. Not only the World War I uh, made possible um, the right of asylum to be bypassed, but in order to justify these um, changes of attitude, British built up a bipolar vision of the world uh, which French authorities gradually actually adopted. So first I have to give a few uh, elements of the context. Uh, the first one being the spread of Indian nationalist movement abroad by the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, as you know, by the end of the 19th century, there, there is already a widespread uh, diaspora from uh, the subcontinent almost all over the world. In, in, in America, all over Asia, and in Europe. Um, and France has a particular uh, uh, place in this uh, uh, movement of the Indian elite and the Indian students. Uh, with the opening of the Suez Canal, uh, France came between uh, the subcontinent and, and England, the ships traveling either from uh, Calcutta at that time, or Bombay, uh, to Marseille, and then the passengers uh, boarding a train to Calais, and from Calais boarding another uh, ship uh, to Dover. And the, this Marseille-Calais Express train was so intimately associated to the passengers uh, uh, hailing from uh, 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 the subcontinent or, or coming from uh, uh, England and, and traveling to, to India, that it gained the name Mar uh, Bombay Express. So as a matter of fact, uh, uh, 
a quite sizable uh, diaspora, mainly made of um, students, um, jewelry brokers, such as the, the, the father of uh, GRD Tata, and of intellectuals uh, start setting up in, in France by the late uh, 19th century and early 20th uh, century. And of course, uh, the spread of the Indian nationalist movement goes along with the spread of the diaspora. Now, we also have to uh, pay a particular attention to uh, the political context of the early 20th uh, century political and educational context. There is a, a growing feeling of um, challenge among the Anglo-Indian um, opinion regarding uh, the Indian elite. What I call Anglo-Indian at that time is uh, really the, uh, uh, the lobby, uh, the colonial lobby in India. Uh, so I make, of course, a distinction with the um, British opinion in, in Great Britain, or of course with the uh, Indian elite speaking English. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, Indian students are uh, faring better and better uh, each year. So much so that uh, in 1905, a French writer uh, wrote those lines. Living far behind his British competitors, the Hindustani becomes English-speaking, sharper, more up-to-date than his masters. And take a student from Bombay and another one from Cambridge. They are so similar to the point of mistaking them. And of course, uh, the, 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 the British uh, and the, the Raj authorities have in mind uh, what happened in the United States we, along with uh, the building up of an elite, a very educated elite, followed uh, very soon the emancipation of the United States of America. So uh, very soon, and especially under Lord Curzon, there will be a series, a set of measures in order to try to contain this rise of, of the uh, uh, Indian elite. And to do this uh, uh, set of measures will uh, um, uh, the, the Indian elite will uh, uh, answer with a growing uh, resistance to the colonial rule. Uh, Bengali uh, deserve a special uh, treatment in uh, this uh, series of measures. Um, as a matter of fact, the same writer uh, mentions everywhere people talk with contempt about Bengali, Bengali baboos, the largest category of rail red indigenous and opponents. Lord Curzon's um, tenure as viceroy from 1899 to 1905 uh, will see uh, a various, various episodes which are very significant in the history, colonial history of India. Um, one of them being a different uh, a reform a uh, uni uh, university uh, reform called the Indian University Railway Commission, but also the expedition in Tibet uh, in 1904, a bloody military expedition in order to unveil an imaginary uh, uh, plot by the Russian to attack India. And we could add to uh, complete the picture of the, the climate, the cultural and intellectual climate the uh, immense popularity of Rudyard Kipling, one of the, uh, of course, foremost promoter of this Anglo-Indian vision of the world. One, uh, one uh, uh, other important aspect for our uh, uh, study here is also what, what was called the gallophobic agenda of the, of the Raj, the anti-French a sentiment which was very much inert to uh, the building up of, of, of British identity, and particularly uh, uh, in India. This is, this is mentioned uh, many times in the, in the French uh, archives through some clippings of, uh, uh, taken from the um, Anglo-Indian press. So we find a combination in uh, 1902 of this 
uh, uh, wish to contain the rise of Indian students and also to uh, um, try to uh, prevent any uh, links between, I mean, any strong links between France and, uh, and India. In 1902, so the Indian University Railway Commission under the government of India concluded that the teaching of subjects such as history, political economy, and French language should be ended. For the French consul, and I must mention that usually French diplomats in India were very pro-British. That, that's not uh, uh, the, the result of a kind of anti-British attitude. Uh, but for the French consul, there are no, do no doubts about the motives behind such a decision. I quote the French consul in, in Calcutta. The Commission for the Reform of Education in India, named by Lord Curzon, scared by the immense progress achieved by the indi indigenous in all the branches of human knowledge, and by the Aster critics against his administration, has simply broken the old instrument, which has yielded two good results, suppressed a big number of secondary schools, and made the access to universities so difficult that a rare elite formed only of the very safe native children will be able to get it. If I am uh, insisting on this anti-French attitude as well, is that we are going to see that with the, the uh, uh, Indian nationalist movement um, building one of its centers in France, British authorities will have to uh, get France on board in order to uh, check the Indian community in spite of having this anti, uh, very openly anti-French uh, uh, attitude. Now, um, if we come to uh, the Indian nationalist movement uh, in India, uh, I, I quote Richard J. Popplewell uh, in his studies of British intelligence. He mentions as one unexpected event in the year 90, 1907, the appearance of Indian revolutionary parties in London, Paris, and Vancouver. As a matter of fact, before uh, World War I broke, the British intelligence estimated that 250 Indians were residing in France. Among them, apart from, uh, as I said, brokers, um, or, or uh, princes, aristocrats, they were students and political activists, particularly Bapat and Emma Das, also called the generals, the three founders of the Paris Indian Society, which was uh, a, a, a kind of uh, affiliate association to the one created by Shyamji uh, Krishnavarma, and Shyamji Krishnavarma, who was a disciple of Tilak, of the nationalist Tilak in Bombay, himself, when he came under uh, tight scrutiny uh, by the British police, shifted his bases from England to France. So uh, the, the early 20th century see a very uh, active uh, nationalist, Indian nationalist center uh, uh, in Paris. The reaction uh, by the British authorities uh, is at the beginning uh, quite, doesn't really cope with the mobility of uh, the, the Indian elite. But um, once more on the Lord Curzon, we see a set of reform which will make possible um, a better or closer uh, surveillance of um, the uh, uh, Indian nationalists. As a matter of fact, it is under uh, a Lord uh, Curzon that uh, the um, intelligence service of the government of India uh, is reorganized from the central office of the Thagi and Dakaiti department. Dakaiti doesn't refer to the inhabitants of Dhaka, but to the Dakoite. Uh, it becomes the Department of the Criminal Investigation, the DCI, in 1904. But uh, in spite of this reorganization, since the, the, law doesn't, the law of the government of India doesn't apply in, in England, um, and since there is very little cooperation between the police 
uh, of the Raj and the police in, in England, um, the, uh, the, in the nationalists, Indian nationalists take advantage of this discrepancy uh, between uh, the law uh, in India and in England to uh, use, um, to use <coughs> uh, England as a platform for their action. And so the, some of the main leaders are Shamsi Krishna Varma, as I mentioned, as well as uh, the well-known uh, um, Binayak uh, Dharmodar Sarvarkar, who will become later on known as one of the uh, promoters of Hindutva uh, ideology. So uh, while between uh, 1905 and 1907, uh, the, the British intelligence uh, our services are getting reorganized. Uh, some uh, nationalists, of those nationalists, uh, move to, to France, including Shyam uh, Krishna Varma. So uh, there is a, a, a growing uh, a concern by the, by the um, British authorities regarding the activities of um, Indian nationalists in France. And uh, in order to have a more efficient action against uh, the, the nationalists in France, um, soon the um, DCI is going to send a representative for uh, uh, Europe, uh, and they are going to uh, also um, um, they are going to offer 38 positions of officers in order to. Uh, uh, control the, in the Indian nationalist community in Europe. The, the year uh, uh, 1909 is marked by the assassination of Sir William Curzon uh, Whaley at the camp of the Secretary of State for Indian Affairs. And that's the first act of this kind on the British soil since the 1880s. So uh, that will really uh, 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 mark the beginning of stiff action and what uh, Richard G. Popperwell called counter-subversive uh, counter measures on a global scale. And the center of the focus is increasingly Paris, uh, like we can read in the British press. The Indian agitation headquartered in, in Paris, a dangerous conspiracy, wrote some papers. The ambassador of France in London addressed notes to the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs in those regards. And Though the French government does not give in any action following those accusations, from 1909 onward, uh, the British authorities seek increasingly cooperation not only for the surveillance of Indians uh, in France, but also for the, ra the arrest of some of them. <coughs> so developing its intelligence activities uh, uh, with regard to the Indian diaspora in France, British authorities stumbled over the right of asylum. And r the right of asylum was a pillar of national sovereignty that British themselves used uh, and by offering asylum to many anarchi anarchists uh, in England uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. So, <coughs> the, 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 of course, the, the British authorities feared that uh, uh, the French government would, would use these attributes of its sovereignty. And the French government feared that if it would uh, actually not respect the right of asylum, there would be a storm created in French opinion. So um, the, the, the right of asylum appears as one uh, uh, concrete obstacle in order to check uh, Indian nationalists in France. So French authorities respond to the diverse uh, uh, um, uh, demand by the British, their British counterparts um, to uh, follow official channels. But one first breach in this right of asylum is going to come soon, uh, between 1909 and 1910, 1910 uh, with what is called the Savarkar Affair. In June uh, 1909, Vinayak Savarkar, one of the most dreaded Indians according to the British authorities, is suspected to be responsible for Sir William Curzon Wiley's assassination. Uh, <coughs> so he's arrested and deported to France. And he manages to escape on the dock of Marseille while being transferred back to, to India. So 
the French uh, uh, police catches him. Um, and the English press quickly launched a campaign protesting strongly against the detention in France of a prisoner belonging to the British authorities and denounced it as an obstruction to British justice. So, of course, as according to French law, there is a judicial trial which is necessary before deciding over the case of the Indian nationalist. The English press called it a diplomatic incident and threatened to take the matter to the House of Parliament. The French ambassador in London noted that the episode of the escape of the young Indian nationalist had become, in effect, the Savarkar affair. The archives of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs do not mention uh, the follow-up of this case, but a clipping informs us that the French government has given in to the pressure of British authorities and finally handed over to them the escape in September without following the normal legal procedure. In the article titled France and the Anti-English Movement, published in the Madras Time and dated 20 September, the French government, I, I quote, did not seek to put to the test the question of his rights. It praises, it praises his conciliatory attitude. France has always, whether voluntary or involuntary, given asylum to conspirators against the English government. In the last few years, the Indian Anarchist Party, at the head of which is the infamous Shamsi Krishnavarma, had found refuge in Paris. The first act of friendship of the French government towards Great Britain was a tacit agreement of the former on the arrest of Binayak Sarkar on French territory. Now, there is another geographical dimension to uh, this relation between the Indian nationalist movement and France. As you know, uh, French, uh, France sorry, had five colonial tiny settlements within the Indian subcontinent, namely Chandanagore, uh, Karikal, Yanaum, Pondicherry, and Mahé. And those villages also were used by Indian uh, nationalists as uh, refuge uh, to escape British authorities. And uh, we could name quite few cases of uh, uh, Indian, uh, leading Indian nationalists uh, being settled in Chandanagore or in Pondicherry. It will take a long time, but th there are a lot of cases, and, and there are also growing suspicion that they are getting weapons from France directly to uh, the French colonial settlement. So it, 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 it has become uh, it has become absolutely essential to uh, the, the containment or to the even eradication of Indian uh, nationalist movement, and especially the Swadesh movement and the Bengali resistance to uh, uh, the British Raj, the British rule, especially after the first attempt of partition in 1905, uh, when Lord Curzon tried to divide a first time Bengal. It becomes increasingly important that uh, uh, France uh, actually uh, um, falls in, in line with, with British uh, 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 authorities' uh, demand. And the obstacles, are, as we saw, are legal with the right of asylum. But, uh, of course, in order to justify France to uh, uh, become solid to British interests, um, the internal security of Great Britain is not enough, especially in a context where uh, the Anglo-Indian uh, opinion is extremely gallophobic. To convince French uh, uh, opinion to uh, be solidar to the British, there is also a need to create a, a, a climate, a cultural, moral, mental climate, which will be uh, uh, in favor of, of British interests. And in, in, in that regard, uh, a British uh, opinion and British authorities are going to uh, successfully try to convince French authorities that the Indian nationalist movement is not a threat only to uh, their authorities, but that uh, the Indian nationalist movement is actually a part of a global threat to the Western world and the free world. And that is quite obvious uh, 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 in, in, different, uh, um, in different tables sent by British uh, authorities to, to French 
uh, uh, authorities. I'm, I'm going to uh, um, quote one of them. In 90, uh, zero, 1907, a cable from British authorities warned the French ones. Our informers tell that, the, that they receive factum from Paris and New York. The aim of all this literature is the, is the toppling of the English government, but I believe that you will easily acknowledge that those who organize this campaign won't feel satisfied until they get the destruction of all European domination in India. And we can find an echo with what Molana Abdul Azam uh, Ka um, Ab Molana Abdul Kalam Azad had uh, wrote. And the response by uh, the French governor in Pondicherry, Alfred Martineau, who is also the founder of Histoire de la Revue, Col uh, Histoire de la Revue Coloniale, and who is one of the uh, um, most important French uh, uh, representative, I mean, uh, important leader of the French colonial lobby, he answers, I have to acknowledge with you that there is truly a close solidarity between European nations in this country, and that following your own expression, there are benefits in cooperating together in order to break down the dangerous organization. On the contrary, when French opinion expressed publicly a solidarity to the uh, Indian nationalist leader, the effects are uh, um, enormous. The eff effects felt in India are enormous. For instance, in 1907, the French Consul General brought to the attention of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs the large echo found by an article published by uh, the Daily Le Temps. The article dealt with the British attempt of partition of Bengal. The article drew a wave of sympathy among Indians and a consecutive raise in the trade with France. The French diplomat noticed in February 1907, from the Indian side, there is an unmitigated satisfaction, the feeling of unexpected and unhoped for. France, impartial and non-vested, France, friend of England, the real France, the one of before found, found of justice, liberty, human progress, was giving a careful ear to, slan to slandered Bengal, to India, who remained loyal but ste steady in the defense of its right. <coughs> and then about a second article published in the same daily, the Indian cause has made immense progress since then. We are since few days the witnesses of extraordinary conversions. So we, we can understand that really at a critical moment of the Swadesh movement, this uh, violent and radical movement of resistance to uh, the, the British rule, uh, the position of France towards the Indian nationalist movement is, is quite crucial. And just uh, before uh, uh, the, the First World War, uh, um, there, there, there is a mounting pressure on the French government in order to deal with the Indian nationalist movement according to the uh, British authorities. Uh, 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 needs and, and wishes. Uh, a last aspect of this um, uh, uh, pressure I is also the, the, communal, uh, the communal dimension that uh, uh, the British try to give uh, to uh, the nationalist movements in India and not only in India but all over the world. Um, there are attempts to link the Egyptian nationalist movement with the Indian nationalist movement, and uh, at certain point even, uh, some cables mentioned the impious alliance between uh, the Hindus and the Muslims against the free world. Uh, and um, so this, of course, will become even more concrete during the First World uh, War. Now. Um, we are, we are coming to uh, the First World War, of course, as, as you know, uh, as you, you, you know, the, the, the f of course, uh, the main theater of, of, the, of war wa was France, and uh, uh, it uh, created a large influx of uh, uh, Indian soldiers uh, in, in France. So uh, with World War I, France was back at the center of counter-subversion. While uh, after 1910-1911, we see much less reports in the French 
archive uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs regarding the uh, uh, Indian community uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, French authorities are not totally uh, uh, given uh, uh, in the, the British demands. Sometimes it accepts them, sometimes it refuses them. Uh, but also because now the, inti the British intelligence is also addressing the French authorities, not through official channels, but directly to the, S the Sûreté, which is the, the French internal security services. But as a whole, from what we can guess, is that since Bikaji Kama is still very active in Paris and, and some other prominent uh, uh, Indian leaders, um, there is a kind of statu quo. And of course, World War I is going to uh, change uh, drastically the situation. In August 1914, Indian troops start embarking for the battlefield in north, north of France, and approximately uh, 90,000 soldiers landed in Marseille, and later on 48,000 members of the Indian Labour Corps, who along with Chinese uh, workers from, uh, came to serve behind the lines. In, on October 27, Bikaji Kama and Esther Rana are ordered to quit the port of Marseille after they have been reported to attempt to discourage their fellow countrymen, the Punjab Regiment troops, to join the battlefield. Germany quickly engaged in an active support to the Indian and Egyptian nationalist movement against its enemies and offered logistic support from Germany or Switzerland. Uh, the, uh, the head of the DCI, uh, Arnold Wallinger, who actually came from India to Euro Europe in 1907 to uh, organize and coordinate the control of the Indian community in Europe, shifted his, quarter, his headquarters to Paris, and officers from India were requested to join the Indian sol uh, soldiers' base camp to check the nationalists and the German propaganda among the troops. Two special uh, Indian post offices were set up in Rouen and Bologne to check the mail received by and sent to the Indian troops with eight translators in the main Indian languages. British uh, authorities were, uh, of course, anxious regarding the loyalty of the Indian soldiers who were the target of both the propaganda. Few soldiers of Pathan origins uh, were receptive to the pan-Islamist propaganda from Berlin and Istanbul and deserted, but it remained uh, marginal. By the end of 1915, after m uh, more than 14 months, months of battles in Flandre, the Indian troops uh, were shifted to the battlefield of Turkey. Dur during the war, with British troops fighting on the French front, the collaboration between the French authorities and the British intelligence became almost total. French uh, agreed to extradi extradi extra sorry, extradite or expel the suspects identified by British intelligence. For instance, the veteran Indian resident in France, S.R. Rana, is expelled along with his German wife and their son to Martinique. And when the British oppose is returned for medical treatment, although French authorities were willing to allow it, Finally, they, uh, they abide by, the British, by the, br the British expectations. After the departure of the Indian troops, the collaboration continued. The French war minister, in a letter dated thir uh, 3 January 1916, gives his consent for the arrest and the handing over to the British authorities for purposes of deportation of undesirable British subjects without these individuals being the object of an expulsion warrant or the regular procedure of extradition. Richard Popperwell confirmed this trend in January 1916. They, the British, put forward far-reaching measures which the French Ministry of the Interior and the Sûreté approved. They gave Indian agitators who had penetrated into, in, into the camp, <coughs> this gave, sorry, Indian agi um, uh, these allowed to arrest and deport Indian ag agitators who had penetrated into the camps, uh, but also any British subject whose presence the military authority authorities considered a danger to the army. So if, if before uh, the uh, World War I, instances of collaboration between French and British authorities occurred, as in the case of Vinayak Sarvarkar, regarding the surveillance of foreign nationals residing in France, uh, it was not a systematic one, and 
during the course of the World War I, it became a, a regular feature. There is a tendency in, in the uh, uh, studies of history uh, in Europe to uh, actually uh, lower down the impact and the importance of uh, the, the Swadesh movement and the resistance to the Raj before uh, Gandhi. And even uh, Richard J. Popplewell tries to lower down the uh, uh, seriousness of, of the threat. But uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, measures, exceptional measures, and the development of uh, the uh, in British intelligence service during First World War will have consequences in the uh, uh, fo very following years. Uh, the violence resistant first to the Korean rule was dealt with, but did not end with the World War I. British intelligence activities considerably grew under the coordination of the Secret Service Bureau, the MI5 and MI6 after 1916s, were benefited so much to the development of counter-subversive policy that under the influence of its intelligence agency, the government of India attempted to perpetuate the rule of exception during the war under the Rolat Act. This, prompt, this prompted the moderate Indian elite to join the resistance till it was abrogated in 1922. So even though the government of India did not manage to maintain the measures of exception uh, uh, in India or, or the same uh, uh, with France, it had gained confidence and it had created uh, um, a first instance which uh, will open the, uh, uh, the door to further such uh, collaboration or, or, or practices. Which brings us to, to uh, uh, um, the last question and the conclusion uh, uh, regarding the, the World War I. Did it accelerate or slow down the emancipation of India? Uh, of course, it's a far-reaching question, but I will deal it just uh, 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 using uh, what has been said uh, earlier. By the beginning of the 20th century, the satisfaction of the uh, in Indian elite's claim was a matter of time. It could be delayed, but not denied. The question of World War I, spinning up or not the emancipation of colonies, has to be seen uh, in the light of the issue of Indian nationalist movement uh, and France before and during World War I. So we can stress two evolutions. As we said, the conflict gave an opportunity for British intelligence to tighten its control and develop a global network of agents where the Indian diaspora had spread. Before World War I, England itself uh, had made use of it by uh, um, had made use of the asylum of uh, the right of asylum, and uh, of course this right of asylum uh, will be uh, before and even more during the World War I uh, uh, totally bypassed. The, the cooperation of France was a key to the success of, of British in containing Indian uh, uh, nationalism. Um, and as I said, uh, British internal security was not a sufficient re reason to incite French government to relinquish uh, its attribute, uh, one important attribute of its sovereignty. So it had to convince, uh, it had to convince a, a, a French government to uh, adopt a, a, a solid attitude to its own interests. So uh, in, in, in that order, it had to depict Indian nationalism as part of a general plot against the Western world. The German propaganda targeting Indian soldiers gave a certain materiality to the idea of a, bi a bipolar opposition where, strangely enough, France and England, both prominent colonial powers, would be representing the free world against a union of feudalism and fascism. The fact that 100,000 soldiers from the colony died to defend France and England, or that United States, Canada, and Switzerland were at times very benevolent to Indian nationalists did not matter. The point was to build up convincing arguments in order to carry out an agenda which was to protect the colonial interest of the moment. And good use could be made of World War I in that respect. The fear of an axis against the free world by, formed by nationalist movement, mainly uh, India and Egypt, uh, Indian and Egyptian nationalist movement, using, using the religious fear was also gradually built up though at this point religion was not playing any significant, significant role uh, in this movement. 
The communal component, on the contrary, was very much part of the British colonial agenda and policy in order to weaken the Indian nationalist movement. This was also part of the colonial schizophrenia. Framing the Indian nationalist movement in a global, bipolar, and scaring vision of the world was also a way to prevent a careful, distinctive approach to Indian internal political issues. When such an approach was adopted by French opinion, it had a huge echo. And it happened on very rare occasion before the World War I, as we saw in the French press regarding the partition of Bengal, and the enthusiastic echo among Indian nationalists. Merging Indian nationalist, nationalism into a global vision of the world was an efficient way to prevent a cool blooded and objective assessment of the actual situation in India by other nations. De therefore, it was an efficient way to slow down the inevitable course of Indian emancipation. After the, after the, the peace, after the war and when, when peace came back, a warming up took place promoted by, um, supported by movement of pacifism, universalism, and brotherly erudition with personalities such as Rabindranath Tagore, Romain Roland, or Sylvain Levy. This momentum fizzled down like a parenthesis with a continuing, within a continuing war and all alliances resurfacing. As a matter of fact, the idea of a colonized world revolting against the Western bonds back simultaneously to resurgent nationalism. For decades to come after World War I, the words of war propaganda with the idea of a clash of civilization will remain available to be recycled and used again as ju justification to encroach on the right of asylum, civil liberties, and to support global surveillance and deportation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berthet, for the, the very interesting uh, paper and uh, for drawing a linkage between um, colonial attitude a century ago and the whole uh, um, uh, the current kind of uh, the war on terror and the clash of civilizations, the nonsense that is being put forward by, uh, um, dare I say, neo-colonial uh, uh, factions. Um, it's very interesting to hear about the discrimination against Indian elites, and uh, this in particular, I think, had uh, uh, a very uh, particular resonance for, uh, for Bengal, as we'll see, I think, in uh, uh, some of the papers that we have tomorrow. And uh, uh, as interestingly, just before I came here, I was uh, looking for some material on the uh, at the, on the British Library, and there is a document which details uh, a report of British intelligence on uh, the political um, uh, activities of Indian students in Britain, a large number of whom are from, uh, were from Bengal as well. Um, and uh, uh, he also mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, the use of uh, surveillance of uh, censorship of Indian letters. There is, of course, this very well-known collection of uh, Indian, uh, uh, the uh, uh, censored letters of Indian soldiers, which is held by the British Library, and that provides us today with uh, an invaluable source, uh, or rather resource, when it comes to finding the Indian voice, um, or the South Asian voice, from uh, that particular conflict, because unlike um, the other nations that were participants of that, uh, uh, that conflict, uh, the Indian voice has been largely lost to uh, history um, uh, for a number of variety of reasons. Uh, we were not able to uh, turn the gaze of the historian on, uh, uh, on our own involvement in that conflict, and it's now taken us, with, it's a century late, better late than never, but nonetheless it becomes exceedingly difficult uh, for historians who are working on the subject to try and come to uh, an understanding of some of the factors uh, as it relates to motivation and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, we will uh, mm, uh, uh, break for tea and uh, be back uh, by 3.50, I, I think, and see you back for the second half of this session. Thank you.